Happy New Year. Hey, I got a phone call from Chris on our worship team last night saying, hey, we got a couple of people out with sickness. Uh, what do we do tomorrow? And well, uh, we, we did really good tomorrow. Can you guys thank the worship teams so much? Just thank you guys. Just love Chris and all that you're doing and our, our worship team. And hey, I'm super excited to be able to start a new series with you guys today. And I wonder, uh, before we stand and greet some, someone and say hello to one another, I, I just wonder if you, like me, have had a challenge before in managing your calendar. I think at the beginning of a new year is a really great time to think about calendar management. And um, I, I spent a little time last couple of weeks just thinking about how we, how we manage our, our calendars well. And I, I read this article because the, the question at the beginning of the article really caught my attention. You just have to go with me on this. You just have to go with me. Just trust me on this one. So the question was this, thinking about calendar management. The question was, why is it important at the beginning of a new year to put your calendar in the freezer? Have you, have you heard this? I'm thinking about calendar management. Why, why is it important to put your calendar at the beginning of the new year in, in the freezer? And the answer was really interesting to me. So um, why is it important to put your calendar in the freezer beginning of new year? The answer was this. So you can start off the new year really cool. So I did some more research and I researched this guy that actually wanted to do exactly this. And so he, he read that if you put your calendar in the freezer, you can start off the new year really cool. And he wanted to be cool because he would define himself as not being so cool. So he wanted a calendar, but unfortunately it, uh, the previous year had been a really tough year financially for him, and so he couldn't afford a calendar, and so he made a really poor choice. He went down here to Target, and he tried to steal a calendar, and unfortunately, he got caught, and you know what he got? He got 12 months. <laughs> it's a good start to the new year, isn't it? <laughs> My jokes still aren't good, I know. We do have a new series, How Shall I Live? I'm really excited about this series to not talk about calendar management, but to talk about things that really matter and to talk about managing our life well based upon Scripture and allowing God to guide that. And if you are just joining us for the first time, good morning, welcome. If you're joining us via the stream for the first time, so glad you're with us. For all of you who are here, these are challenging times. And we know that so many of us are, are out. Some of you have been sick and you're back. We're glad you're back. But Either way, boy, we got a, a big year ahead of us, and I believe God's in it, and we just trust that He's going to lead us and protect us, and I'm so glad you're here. Will you stand up and say good morning to someone? My name's Jeffrey Smith, and I'm glad you're here. If you don't mind, why don't you greet someone from a little distance, unless you just really want to hug somebody, but say hello, share a little love, we'll get started. So we are, we are beginning a new series. Will you say this after me as we begin this morning before we pray? Say this, all of me. All of me. Come on, say this, all of me. All of me. I, choose to give. I choose to give. Whatever you desire, I choose to live. Will you bow your heads with me this morning? Father, that is our prayer that truly all of me, that I would choose to give to you. Whatever you desire in my life, that is how I choose to live. Lord, I pray that that's the prayer for each of us. As we begin a new year, it is such a fitting time to pause and reflect, not just on where we've been and what we've done, but where you desire to take us. Lord, we do not want to step forward without your lead, so we are praying that you lead us as we begin this new study of your word and that you would reveal to each of us areas of our lives that need addressing and then that we would be willing to let you do what you desire. We give you this time and all God's people said, amen. amen. Grab a seat. I want to ask you this question and want you to consider the question this morning. And the question is this, am I who I want to be? Will you consider that question this morning? You might even want to write that question. If you're following along in the, the app, the Donaldson First app, you'll see that's the question there right at the beginning on that first page in the app there for you, am I who I want to be? I mean, just think about this question for a moment. When it comes to aspects of your life, maybe even consider how you lived in 2021. Can you say that you lived in a way that 
was honoring to God in a way that you desired? I want to put a few questions on the screen for you, and I just want you to think about them. Some will be more relevant to you maybe than others based upon your life and your history, but in your marriage, for those of you who are married, am I who I want to be? As a parent, a grandparent, I have to consider this one. Am I who I want to be at the office? Am I who I want to be when I'm with my friends? Am I who I want to be? When it comes to the things I think about, my thought process, the things I focus on, those things deep in the the darkness of my secret life, am I who I want to be in my dating life? For those of you who are dating or or in that season of dating or considering dating, am I who I want to be? Here's one probably for all of us in my online life when it comes to my socials or what I view, what I spend time looking at and thinking about, am I who I want to be? And then look at the screen, this one, in my relationship with my creator, with God, am I who I want to be? Am I truly who I want to be? I I can tell you this, guys. I'm not, but I sure want to get there. And I don't just say that because it sounds like something I should say. It's, it's true. I'm, I'm not the person I want to be. I, I sure want to be the person I want to be. I want to be the person that God desires I be. And I wonder if you're fully honest with yourself if you come to the same conclusion this morning. That's why this series, How Shall I Live, I believe can be such a powerful one for us as we consider the new year and and not calendar management, but we consider life management and who God is calling us to be, what he expects of us in our life. He is going to call us, I believe, to areas of life that need addressing and to give over areas of our lives that need addressing. We, we'd love to hand off to you guys little, little thoughts. We've done a family focus before and a thankful task and peaceful pursuit Well, throughout this series, we're going to give you what we are just simply calling three words, give to live. Everyone say give to live. We want you to think about over this series, how long is this series going to be? I don't know how long this series is going to be. We'll see where the Lord takes us in this series. But I do know this, to live as God desires, I have to be willing to give to God what he desires. Do you you agree with this statement? I mean, to really live as God desires, look at this, I have to be willing to give to God what he desires. And so each week we're going we're gonna to give you a give to live. I've got one, actually two for you this morning, and it's a prayer. You'll find it on the app. Uh, you'll also find it, even if you don't follow the notes, inside the images on the app sometime this week. We put all of those as well there on the app in a couple of different places. But two prayers for you. If you're a writer, I encourage you to write these two prayers this morning. If not, I hope that you'll process and begin to allow God's Spirit just to take your mind in the direction of this give to live. And the first is this with the give to live. Number one, Lord, reveal to me how I shall live. And what a, what a, what a great step for us as we begin this new year. Number one, Lord, that you'll, you'll reveal to me how I shall live. Who are you calling me to be? And then secondly, an equally important prayer for us, Lord, will you empower me? We, I don't know we pray this enough. God convicts us. He he places things on our, on our hearts or he puts people in our lives that, that point us in the right direction. He navigates us through a variety of ways, through his word or through music or through a commercial or a song we hear. And we're like, yeah, I need to be better there. Or I need to do better there. But I'm not so sure we take this next step of saying, Lord, will you empower me? Because without the empowerment of the Lord and his Holy Spirit, it's meaningless that we move forward. Amen, church? I mean, that prayer is so important. Lord, will you, will you empower me to just give you what you desire so that I will be who you desire I be. When it comes to goals and pride and and bitterness and fear and apathy and the future and struggles over regret of of the past and lust and selfishness and anger, I mean, the list is really quite endless, is it not? Church, I truly believe this. If you will make this give to live your priority here at the beginning of this new year, I truly believe that the Lord, he will reveal to you areas of your life that need addressing. And that if you will ask him, I truly believe it, he will empower you to do whatever is necessary to get those areas of your life in line with him. And man, what a powerful, fun way to begin the new year. I'm so excited. 1 John chapter 1 is where we're going to be if you have your Bible with you uh, this morning. 1 John chapter 1, we're actually going to look at verses 1 
through 10. Uh, and I, I got to show you a really fun, cool bracelet that I'm wearing. Uh, I've had this bracelet on, the first bracelet, for, for most of 2021. If you journeyed with us in 2021, you remember we had a lot of great series, teaching series last year. Uh, first was one of my favorites, but it was our first one. Uh, and then now we are moving into a new one that I'm equally jazzed about. And each of you uh, are going to get one of these bracelets at the end of our worship today. I want to encourage you to grab a bracelet. If there's someone in your home who's not here today, or just a friend or a neighbor or a co-worker, hey, grab a How Shall I Live bracelet for them. And you're going to find the verse, 1 John 1, verses 5 through 7 on this bracelet as well. But I want us to begin this morning uh, by reading the entirety of this book, 1 John chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in front of you, or you can follow along on the app as well. Uh, Ten verses to begin our new year in the right direction, in God's Word. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, read along with me. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at at our hands and have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. Verse 3, we proclaim to you that we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy, everyone say joy. We write this to make our joy complete. John is saying we're writing, sharing these truths with you to make our joy complete. Verse 5, this is the message, listen to this. We have heard from him and declare to you God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all sin unrighteousness. What a great promise. Verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, I've thought about 1 John quite a bit last couple of weeks. As a matter of fact, I shared with our ministry team on Monday, even though we already had these bracelets and had already printed this verse or this reference to this passage in 1 John on these bracelets that I felt we were going to go in an entirely different direction scripturally. And so we prayed about it as a ministry team, and we all headed off to our week. And as I got into the Word and settled in my office this week, the Lord just kept bringing me back and bringing me back to this very uh, insightful but equally challenging passage, 1 John. So obviously the ministry team knows now that uh, we, in fact, are back in 1 John and not going where I thought we might have been headed, and as I've, I've spent time in First John this, this week, and I, I think you guys are going to see this, in, in many ways, First John is this litmus test for how we should live. It's really this, this uh, lens the Lord gives us into the heart of, of who He is through these words of John, really calling us to this, this place of, of, of living above the standard that our world has set for us. And you know this as a Christ follower. You know, I, I gave my life to the Lord uh, at the age of eight, I remember getting on my knees and, and praying with my mama and my daddy in their, their bedroom in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. We lived in Pine Bluff until I was 10, and then we moved to Little Rock. My parents are still in Little Rock. And I remember praying with, with my mom and my daddy that week. And over the course of the next two weeks, my older brother, he gave his life to the Lord. And my daddy actually gave his life to the Lord. He thought that he uh, was a Christ follower, but, but had never come to that place of life surrender. And we had a revival at our church there. Uh, at Lakeside Baptist in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. And I remember watching my daddy walk the aisle and give his life to the Lord all within a couple of weeks, again, of me, my brother, making the same choice. We all got baptized on the same day, and it was super fun. And I, I had that great memory of going through the waters of baptism, or ba baptism with my, my brother Kent and my daddy Jerry. And I, I'm sure you guys would agree with me as, as Christ followers that when you, when you look over the the span of your life as a Christ follower. There are these mountaintop moments. There are these less than mountaintop moments. 
But the hope is, and I think we're going to see this in Scripture, that Scripture is really pushing us in this direction, that even in the ups and in the downs, hopefully as we look at our lives, we can see that there's this, there's this pattern that's, that's upward. Even though there are dips along the way in the upward, there's this trajectory that's, that's upward, that's, that's really a, a history of our walk in growth and who He is calling us to be. And this is why I believe this series can be so impactful for us because this is a really great time here at the beginning, guys, of a new year to just take time to, to pause before uh, the new heavy rush of a new year and settling into life and work and the, the, the ornaments are gone and the trees are down and most of the gifts have been returned that you really didn't like anyway and you're back into the regular flow and schedule. This is a really, really great time before this year well, it becomes history to pause and to consider what is my life all about and how am I living and what does Scripture call me to and who does, who does Scripture call me to be? And I just, listen, guys, I just want to encourage you. If you're writing, will you just write this this morning? I welcome what the Lord has for me this year. Will you write that? I welcome what the Lord has for me this year. And I hope that you'll just make it your prayer, Lord, more. Whatever you want, whatever you desire, that's what I welcome. John, we believe the author of 1 John, is known as the disciple whom Jesus loved. We believe that John is the disciple who reclined on the chest of Jesus there at the Last Supper. He was there at the cross when Jesus died. History would tell us that, that John departed Jerusalem before the destruction of the city by Rome around A.D. 67. We looked at a timeline a few weeks ago, just a, a brief timeline of, of just the historical context of all that, that happens in the Bible. We know that John later settled in the idolatrous city of, of Ephesus, which is now western Turkey. And in this time of writing, you, you probably know this, and if not, it's going to make these words, I believe, come more alive for us. There's just a lot being said about who Jesus was. Was he a man? Was he God? Was, was he both? Was he a lie? There's much deception and teachings of, of untruth. There's also, look at 1 John chapter 4, there's also evil spirits, and we know this. We're not really going to pause long on this, but, uh, but John points to this, this evil spirit known as the Antichrist in this world. And John refers to this, look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 2. John says, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ has come in the flesh from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. John's wanting us to know that there's great deception in this time, obviously in our time as well. And so he really wants us to understand this idea of truth. You may even want to write down the word truth. I'm going to give you some specific points here in just a moment. But John spends verses 1 through 4 really building his case as to, hey guys, what I'm about to tell you and what we're about to study over the next X number of weeks, John wants us to know, hey, you can hang your hat on this. This is true. He wants you to know, I, I know this man. If, if John were here today, he would probably say, hey, I journeyed with this man. I did life with this man for three years. I watched these miracles unfold that are indescribable. I saw him speak and command spirits to leave bodies. I saw him bring people back to life. I saw him do things that, that John never in his wildest imagination could have imagined that he would ever see. He, he heard Jesus. He saw him. He touched him. He was there when he died along with Peter he was one of the first to go to the tomb and see that empty tomb after Jesus came back to life. John was one who had a, a beachside breakfast cooked by Jesus himself. Fish, can you imagine what it's like? My wife can cook up some, some pretty good ham and eggs, but I'm telling you, I can't imagine what it would have been like for John to sit there with Jesus and to eat fish on that beach. John is telling us, wanting us to understand over and over again in verses 1 through 4. I won't read back, them, back, to them, back through them again for you guys, but he's wanting us clearly to understand that this is truth, that what he's telling us we absolutely can believe in. And I tell you what, is, what has been so clear to me as I've read this passage countless times over the last couple of weeks 
that there is this expectation set here in this passage by John on how we should live. So, how shall we live? Well, today's going to be an overall just vision casting of where we're headed. Each week, I believe, hereafter, just to kind of give you a heads up, uh, we're going to look at specific character qualities and attributes. I think we're going to the Old Testament. We'll see what happens over the next week as the Lord leads. But I believe we're going to, uh, whether old or new, we're going to park each week on a specific character quality, and you just don't want to miss it. So whether you're here or watching online, catch the archive. Let's kind of vision cast for a little bit today. How shall I live? Let me give you a couple of thoughts. Number one, great place for us to begin. Realize God is truth. Realize God is is truth. John is building his case for how we should live by first proclaiming this idea of light. Look at verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light. Everyone say light. It's a really important word for us. Say it. Everybody say light. God is light. God's use of the word light actually points us to this idea of God being light. Truth. Now, we've, we've studied this word light before. You probably remember we studied Genesis 1. The first words, interestingly, that God speaks, we read in Genesis 1 where it says, God said, let there be what? Let there be light. And we've studied that word light before, that it doesn't just mean the opposite of darkness. No, it means relief from the darkness. But that word in the Hebrew is a different word for light that we read here in the Greek. And this word here in the Greek actually means truth. So when John is telling us that God, again in verse 5, is light, he is telling us, in fact, that God is truth. We see him use this, this word in 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. It's that same word we actually see for light. We also see it in verse 8 when he says, if we claim to be without sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And then we find John ending this letter. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. I'll put it on the screen for you. John says this as he ends the book of 1 John, or the letter of 1 John. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. By being in his son, Jesus Christ, he is the true God and eternal life. Because every time we see these words here in 1 John, it's the same Greek word that we see here. John used in verse 5, God is light. He wants us to get it. He clearly wants us to understand this. I don't believe it's of any coincidence. He wants us to have this knowledge. As a matter of fact, John uses the word knowledge 15 times in this short book of five chapters. He wants us to clearly understand this is truth. This is the knowledge you should hold on to. God is light. God is truth. He wants us to get it. And I believe it's a great place for us to begin. Here's a long sentence for you to write if you're writing. God is, in fact, the light. God is the light that illuminates the way for me to live in a dark and deceptive world. I know you know this, but man, you sure need to remember this. Because what a world of uncertainty and a world of deception in which we live today. You know this. God's truth is the gauge by which we determine right from wrong. And I think when we get into this casual way of living as Christ followers, it can be very dangerous for us to to look at the screen and to say, well, Jeffrey, yeah, I know that. Give me something new. Well, the, the new is we need to be reminded of what it is that we already know. Because it is a deceptive world. It is... It is a world, as John reminds us in 1 John, of an enemy that wants to steal and kill and destroy, one who is deceptive, the the Antichrist. John spends a lot of time building this case because he wants us to clearly know that the knowledge of the world is silly. I mean, we need to be reminded of this. There's much knowledge in our world, pop culture and philosophers and scientists and world thinkers who try to discombobulate and mislead and often spin dysfunction that's not founded on the light and the truth of God's Word and is delivered to us through this secularized lens of research and rationale and people much smarter than me. I tell you, I, I so know that I need to rely on John's Word to lead me because I'm not smart enough to let myself lead me in a world that can so... Easily, easily mis, misguide me 
And as Christians, it's just a reminder for us. John, he, he understands this. Christians are being persecuted in this time. They're being misled. They're, they're scattered. Many of his friends have been martyred. And so life is, is, is challenging. Their lives have been turned upside down. But in the midst of all this, guys, look at verse 4. Look what John writes in verse 4. He wants us to understand again why he is writing and sharing these words with us. We write this to make our joy complete. This is why historical context is always so important to us when we are studying God's word. It isn't just that he's speaking joy. He's wanting us to know in the midst of dysfunction and upheaval and a culture that's constantly working to, to mislead, there is a peace, there is a joy that can be found when we choose to hold on to, to the light of who Jesus is and to that truth. And I think this is so important, particularly in a time of, of hurt and and of a, and a pain, I, I preached a wedding uh, just a few months ago, uh, a family friend of ours. And sadly, uh, one of the members of that family uh, who was there, who I had just met for the first time uh, at this wedding, passed away from COVID. And it was just a, a shock for our family to, to hear this. And uh, our close family who live right around the, the block from us are, are beginning their new life together as a married couple, dealing it was actually... Uh, her brother who, who passed away, and I thought this week about just the sadness of, 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 of life right now and, and, and death, and I, I talked to Miss, Miss Day, I believe Miss Day's here uh, somewhere, I hope it's okay for, for me to say this, Miss Day, we, we talked last week, and I've so enjoyed getting to know so many of you guys since I've been here a little over a year, and Miss Day's just been super encouraging, but, but she stopped me last week, many of you probably know that this is that one-year anniversary of, of the loss of her husband, and Miss Day, I never... I never got to meet your husband, but I just know he was a wonderful man, and I know this is a difficult time for you and for, for anyone who's, who's dealing with loss. But I love what Miss Day said to me last week. And again, I didn't even know for sure that we were going to park here in First John. And she said, she said Jeffrey, I'm, I'm really, really sad, but I also have joy. I just think that's really powerful, Miss Day. And I think that's, that's God's word and, and truth coming alive right, in, right there in your own life. And in the midst of our personal hurts, and in the midst of our, of our personal pain, and John is dealing with pain. Again, this, this world that's been turned upside down since Jesus died and came back to life and, and ascended back to heaven and all of these lies that, that, are, that are spinning. Hey, I hope for every hurting heart today that you'll be reminded of this truth. Listen, when I live realizing God is truth, I experience joy that far outshines my pain. And I think Miss Day's life example it's a testament to this. When I live realizing God is truth, I experience joy that far outshines my pain. How shall I live? Secondly, refuse to remain in the darkness. God is light. God is truth. So secondly, we have to refuse to remain in the darkness. Verse 5 of 1 John, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. And if we claim to have fellowship with him, and yet walk in the darkness. Look at this verse. Church, don't, don't blow past this verse. Look what it says. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth. Let me put that in modern day English. If you call yourself a Christ follower, but you're feeding sin consistently in your life and making excuses for it. Well, I deserve it. Or she cheated on me. Or why can't I have what someone else has? Or life's just been tough. Or I, I need a break. Or whatever. Fill in the blank. We're all really good at rationalizing and making excuses for our sin. But look at what John says. If you claim to have fellowship, but yet you walk in the darkness, look at what he says. These aren't my words. These are his. We lie and we do not live out the truth. The Greek word here for darkness actually means shadiness. Did you know this? It means shadiness. It also means blinded to the truth. So, what John is telling us here is if, if you say you live in the light, but you actually feed your sin or make excuses for your sin, you're just living a shady life. Every one of you probably have worked with someone who you would define as shady before. I hope I'm not that someone, but we, we've all got that person where we're like, man, that was just a shady deal. Or I, I paid for this and I didn't get what I wanted. And, and that, that was just, that was just a, a shady situation. That's what this word means here in the darkness, a shady 
blinded to the truth life. I was trying to come up with just this great analogy. I'm, I'm not sure this one works. It, it worked for me when I was half asleep the other night and I woke up and I was thinking for some reason about being in a cave. I remember going spelunking years ago with students at a camp where I spoke and it was super scary and super scary, but super fun. And I'm so glad I did it. But imagine you're in a cave. Just go with me on this and you can't see anything. Crazy dark, no light. So you begin to reach around trying to find your way. And with your right hand, you reach and you, you feel something warm, maybe a little, little, little furry, maybe a little wooly. Maybe you're thinking it's a nice fur coat. Stephen's got a fur coat. He wore it to work there day. It looks really good on him. And so maybe you're thinking maybe that's something really warm and, and, and furry and, and in, inviting. And then with your left hand, you reach out and you feel something kind of long and, and hard and, and metal and, and, and cold and you're thinking, I'm not so sure what that is. Maybe it's a cage. I don't know. I don't, I don't think I want to go there. So you're, you're frantic. You're, you're, you're cold. You're, you're freaked. It's dark. And so what do you do? You lunge at the feel good. And you, 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 you lunge at it with all that you've got. And you probably know where I'm going with this, only to realize moments later that you've awakened a sleeping giant of a bear who's quite hungry. And then you realize the thing that you reached to touch on your left was actually a shotgun, and it would have helped you with the bear. But in your darkness, I don't know if this is working or not, but in your darkness... It's just, it's foolishness. And so obviously what you lunged at in your darkness thinking it would be the thing that would fulfill you or satisfy you or make you feel good is actually the thing that will devour you. I think that's what John is saying to us here. That you, may, you may make excuses or it may be a feel-good moment for you. It may feel like in the moment that it's going to go down all good, but darkness is darkness. And it's shady. And at some point it's going to bite you. And it just might devour you, the darkness of life. Wow, that's why he points this out to us. The darkness of life so misguides and misleads and eventually leads to ruin in our life. And John is reminding us, church, we can't be blinded to this, meaning you can't make excuses for it. You can't make excuses for it because when you do, you live a lie. And when you choose to embrace your darkness, it's only a matter of time before the darkness, well, leads you down a dark road of no return. John chapter 3, look at this, verse 19. John continues to write this, not in 1 John, but in the book of John. We see this, this pattern of him talking about, about light. This is John, verse 19 of chapter 3. He says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. We see this pattern in John's writing of John wanting, listen to this church, John wanting to turn the light on in our lives as Christ followers. Not in a condemning way, but in a way to reveal to us the reality of our hearts, the reality of, of our shadiness. And it got me thinking about our church. And listen, I want, I want to be just really careful. And I want you to hear me when, when, when I say this. But if, if you want to be a part of a church that, that merely aims to, to only make you feel good, I mean, if you want to come to a church that, that just, just wants to make you feel good for who you are and how you live and how good your life can be, then Donaldson First probably isn't the church for you. I mean, he, hear me. Yes, we, we want you to feel good about who you are. We want you to feel good about how your life can be and where you're headed in life. But of equal importance and maybe of more importance, we also want to encourage to bring light to those areas of darkness, even though it doesn't always feel good to do so. And to shine the light on those areas of your life that, that need addressing, not to condemn you, but to bring you, listen, to bring you out of your own personal shadiness and bring you into the light. Donaldson First is a long sentence, but I wanted you to see this this morning. Just look on the screen. Donaldson First is a church that will help bring those in darkness out of their personal shadiness and into the light. And this only happens through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Remember that verse in John I just read to you, verse 19? Listen to John 3, verse 20. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for their fear that deeds will be exposed. But look at this. Whoever lives by the truth, there's that Greek word again, truth. Whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Wow. Everything we do is done in the sight of God. Guys, I want to encourage you, give permission. I want to encourage you, give permission to someone in your life that they help bring light to those areas of your life that are dark. 
just want to encourage you that there's someone in your life to say, you know what, I give you permission to help bring light to those areas of my life. There it is right there. Give someone permission in your life to do this. I have my wife, I have close friends that do this for me. You all have this permission. Every one of you have this permission. I hope I have this permission in your life as well, that, that we welcome people coming into our lives to shine the light into those dark areas. This is who we are called to be as, as Christ followers. Because think about this, if you, if you allow this, if you, if, you, if you know that you're living in darkness, isn't this way, listen, isn't this way of living exhausting? I mean, isn't really a sinful life exhausting? It's the constant spin. It's the constant rationalizing. It's the mental, it's the physical, the spiritual anguish of knowing who you are, looking in the mirror and seeing spiritually who you are, but not wanting to allow light to pierce that darkness. Listen, this is what community is about. This is why we, we push life groups and home groups. And in 2022, we're going to talk a lot about disciple groups. We want you to be discipled, iron, sharpening iron, loving on one another, not just attending a class on Sunday for an hour, but doing life together with people who are struggling with your struggles, who have been there, who, who are going to be there, offering wisdom. It's what I love about Clyde. Clyde, our chairman of the deacons, he's one of our, our life group leaders, and we usually grab lunch before a, a deacon's meeting. We're going to grab lunch next week, and he's always got a really good joke for me. I should probably use some of Clyde's jokes from time to time up here, but he also really challenged me. He asked me how he can pray for me. We have great conversations, and I'm Clyde. I'm so, I don't even know if Clyde's here today, but I'm so thankful for Clyde. I know he's been sick. Uh, the, the, the family, I think their whole family has been sick recently, but I'm just so appreciative of him. And guys, I just, I just want to remind you let Scripture, let this church, let your community sharpen you this year and nudge you and push you because a life of guilt and regret and pain and sorrow and loneliness and despair is not what you're here for. It's not what you're here for. And the key to really getting on the other side of darkness, because on the other side of darkness is freedom. You know this, don't you? On the other side of darkness is freedom. The key to getting there is just admitting that you need to get there. That's the first step. Just admitting that this is where I need to get to. And this is why we're constantly building programming. This is why we were so jazzed about first things first after the worship service today. We've, we've canceled. Some of our team is out. And some who wanted to be here are out. So we're hitting pause on first things first. Uh, but I want to invite all of you, if you're new here, uh, if you have been here for a while but just want to know, hey, what is our church all about and what do I need to know about, then, hey, put this on your calendar when the date comes back. We'll, we'll kind of just watch COVID for a little bit. But first things first, our Let's Go training next week has also been posted. Postponed. We're just going to hit pause on both of these for a while. But this is why we continue to build programming for you, to help you in areas of your life, to get you serving, to get you jazzed about serving. Also, I want to mention that next week, Divorce Care begins on January 16th. Uh, if you'd like to be a part of that, you can call the office. You can register for that event on the app. But we just want to continue this year to nudge you to get on the other side of darkness. That's who God has called you to be. Let me give you another thought. How should I live? Number th three, realize who I am. Such a big one. Realize who I am. Verse seven, if I walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. But verse eight says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Number three, realize who I am. Who am I? Everyone should write this down because no one is exempt of this. You, I, we are sinners. We are sinners. I am sinful, and you are sinful, and let's don't act like we're not because we are. Every one of us is sinful. John confirms we are all sinners, that we are not perfect, but that we are in need of addressing our sin. We're going to see that in just a moment as we end. Because look, the claim of sinlessness. Look at verse 8. The claim of sinlessness, number one, is self-deception. Do you see this? Self-deception. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. So to claim you don't have sin, Scripture says you are deceiving yourselves. And it doesn't end there, does it? No, look at verse 10. The claim of sinlessness isn't just self-deception, but it's also, get ready for this one, church, blasphemy. Verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him, Jesus, 
we make him out to be a liar. If you say you are sinless, then you don't know who you are because you are sinful. We are all fallen. Now, hopefully we're not living in the fall and hopefully we're moving towards the light and hopefully we're not feeding the sin of our lives, but we've all sinned. We are a sinful people and the claim of sinlessness leads us down a dark road of self-deception and blasphemy. That's why when you write this, realizing who I am reveals who I need. Realizing who I am reveals who I need. When I realize I'm a sinner, I realize that that I need God in my life. I see my life for for what it truly is. I I had someone recently tell me they they were a diabetic, and before she was a diabetic, she said, you know, Jeffrey, my, my life was really challenged. She said, it's still challenged now. But she said, before I knew I was a diabetic and I, I had these, these challenges with my body and these ups and downs and, and, and mood swings. And she said, now, now that I know, I'm still having to deal with my diabetes. But she says, my body is differently now. And I even wrote this down. She says, now that I know I have diabetes, I've actually become healthier. I feel better. And I live a more productive life. Because she saw that area of her life that needed addressing. And it's still there. She still has to continue to address it. But she sees herself as, as, she, as she is, how similar this is to our walk with the Lord. That once you realize who you are, the dark areas of your life can then be addressed. And you can take the steps in addressing these. This is what this study is going to be all about for us. Because once, listen guys, once you see yourself as a sinner, you realize how desperate you are to need the, the freedom that can only be found in Jesus Christ. You realize how desperate you are to be set free, to be set free from your sins. Here's a two-sentence right, if you're writing again with us today. Jesus is the light. I really like this. Jesus is the light that illuminates me to who I am so that I can become who he has made me to be. Jesus is the light that illuminates me to who I am so that I can become who he has made me to be. I know that's a long sentence. Here's a follow-up sentence to that one. He is the only one who can deliver me from my darkness. Period. He's the only one who can. He's the light that illuminates me to who I am so that I can become who he has made me to be. And listen, he's the only one who can deliver me from my darkness. There ain't no self-help book no New York Times bestseller, no four-part study, no amazing workout. There's nothing that can deliver me from my darkness other than Jesus. Now, there may be attributes to this, and there may be people that come along, and there may be studies and books that help, but it begins with the light of Jesus. And guys, I hope you welcome this process this year. That's why step number four How shall I live is so important. If you're writing this morning, number one, repent over what I've done. It's not the fun one of the study, but it's an important one before we move forward. Repent from what I've done. 1 John 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all. Everybody say all. Purify us from all un." Righteousness, knowing who I am isn't enough. Knowing who I am can begin the journey to repent over what I've done and can lead me to who he has called me to be. Hey, here's a great definition of the word repent to help us. You know what it means, but let me just remind you and nudge you a little bit. Repent means the expression, the expression of sincere regret or remorse over wrongdoing. It's an expression. It's not just knowledge. It's an action. To repent is action. It's an expression of sincere regret over remorse and wrongdoing. And when you do this, here's what's super cool, guys. When you do this, two things happen when I repent. Number one, I see God for who he is, faithful and just. I see him for who he is. When when I repent, I see that God is faithful and just because it says here, listen to it again, he is faithful and he is just and he will forgive me. So when I repent, two things happen. Number one, I see God for who he is. He's faithful and just. And number two, I receive what God does. Look at what he does. Look at what he does. He offers a purification through his forgiveness. Who is he? 
He is a faithful and just God, and what does he do? He forgives and he purifies. Listen, listen to these two verses. This is Colossians 1, verse 13 says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption for the forgiveness of our sins. Isn't that good? Hebrews 10 says this, Their sins and lawless acts, look what it says, I will remember no more. This is a really important one. I'll give you one passage and we'll finish, or one, one point. But look at this, guys. I, I need to pause here for a moment because I thought about this verse this week. Look, look what, sin, what it says about our sins. Sins and lawless acts, when we repent, I will remember no more. Now, I struggle with this passage because I can stand right before you guys right now and I can think of foolish things I've done in my past that I regret. And I've repented of these things. I read this scripture that says, I will remember no more. God, he, he forgets my sin. The scripture tells us as a matter of fact, he separates them as far as the east is from the west, but yet in my mind, it's still there. You know what I'm talking about? Are you with me? I think we, we've all been there. We're probably, if you're willing to admit, we all have this, this log of our past. There were things that we remember, and sometimes they, they haunt us. And honestly, many of the conversations I have with, with, with people in life and here at church and through my years of ministry have, have really been this struggle of, hey, I, I, I know where I've been and what I've done and I've repented, but it's still there and it, it hurts me and it haunts me. And so, so how, do we do, how do we deal with this? It's probably an, an entirely new, new study for us, but guys, I think the idea, listen, of, of walking in the light is critical here because, listen, the more, the more that you spend time with God, the more you begin to process things the way he does. The more that you spend time in his word, the more you begin to see you as he does. And it doesn't mean that there's this magical button you push and you just forget, because that's probably almost impossible. But I believe it does mean this, that when it comes to your struggles, rather than looking at them with regret, you look at them with thankfulness for forgiveness. Rather than focusing on where you've been, you're so thankful for where he's taking you. Rather than living in a life of, of guilt, you focus on his goodness. And you're so in gratitude of, of who he is and how he's redeemed and remade and reborn you. This is why, listen, fellowship is so important. Look at verse 7, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. Look at what it says. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, look at what it says. We have fellowship with one another. You see, when our desire is to be out of the darkness and into the light, then we, we find strength and encouragement and fellowship in one another. And in those moments of regret and guilt, it's a phone call, it's a quick text. Hey, pray for me. I'm struggling with that thing I talked to you about. And we have freedom. Listen, church, we have freedom in our life groups and in our small groups rather than sitting there quietly thinking, I'm not going to speak because I don't want them to know this about me. No, instead... We allow God's word to, to, to penetrate those areas of our lives that need addressing and we're willing to talk about them because, listen, the more we talk, it feels better. And most likely there's someone in the room who needs to hear us talk because they need to begin talking too. And so we begin to feed one another and we encourage one another. And that repentant process of living in the light, what does it do? Look at what it says again in verse 7. We have fellowship. You know what that word fellowship means? It means encouragement. It means unity. It means undivided brotherhood. We have that with one another. Oh, my word, how should I live? So much that we're going to unpack through this story, through this, this study in 1 John, and wherever the Lord is going to take us in the Old Testament, with whoever we're going to walk and look through, I know what we're going to see over and over and over again is this call for each of us to examine our lives. And so the last point I give you this morning is just one word, number five. Hit, repeat. Hit, repeat. Everything that we talked about today, the key to this, to this process of living in joy and finding this fellowship is about hitting repeat on the first four points I've given you. I'm not even going to walk back through them right now. I know we're out of time already. But hitting repeat on this study, on these, these attributes of living in the light and pursuing the truth and avoiding the darkness that we choose every day one day at a time to hit repeat in our lives 
and to choose to walk in that journey, in that direction that's honoring to him. Quickly, 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 look at verse 6. A word I want you to see as we finish this morning. If we claim two words, it's actually one word, but it's mentioned twice. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But look at verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Do you see the word that's mentioned twice? It's the word what? It's the word walk. Will you write this word down this morning? It's the word walk. I think about my relationship with, with Amy and my walk with her, our 28 years of, of marriage and my desire to honor her and respect her and, and love her. She would tell you that there have been many times when my walk has just simply been in the wrong direction. And I've said stupid things and I've done stupid things and I've made smarty comments and I haven't offered her grace when she's made a smarty comment. But hopefully overall in my walk with Amy, there's this trajectory that's moving upward. And though we fail each other and don't always get it right for one another, it's our desire to walk in a manner that honors each other. And that's who the Lord's calling us to be here. Because listen, walking is not about perfection. It's about purification. It's about one day at a time, stripping away the old and being covered in the new. That's how I am called to live. Guys, this is going to be a great journey for us. Will you bow your heads with me this morning? Walking in the light, it's not about perfection. It's about purification. I hope that you will welcome this journey. I want to take you back to the give to live just with your head bowed and your eyes closed. Those two prayers that I gave you as we began this morning, the first is this, Lord, reveal to me how I shall live. Will you make that your prayer right now, church? Reveal to me how I shall live. In my marriage, in my private life, in my online life, in my career, in my kids, in my grandkids, Reveal to me how you want me to live, Lord. Imagine if you got serious about making that your prayer every day this year, what the Lord would reveal to you. And then secondly, Lord, empower me to give you what you desire. Will you make that your prayer right now, church? Just, Lord, would, would you just empower me? You would reveal to me areas of my life that need addressing and then you'll just empower me to do what you've called me to do. Father, that is our prayer. That you would lead us. You would reveal the darkness, the shadiness of our lives. That you would bring light to those areas. And you would give us fellowship and joy. As you empower us to do what you're calling us to do. For your glory, we ask this in your name. Amen. Will you guys stand with us? For your